Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for your word. It is the truth. We receive it written in our heart and mind. Thank you for the revelation you're bringing forth this night. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please be seated, if you would. We're sharing with you messages in regards to end times and preparation for the end times. And we're currently talking on the subject of how you must receive correction to be righteous and holy in these last days unto the coming of the Lord. It is mandatory. Everyone must come in line with the Word of God, and that includes receiving correction. We see in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17, as we have seen, the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? This shows us the fact that the judgment is going to come to the house of God before it comes to the world. And we must be ready to pass that test, that judgment that is going to be coming. We know that the judgment comes to the church first, and then there will be a judgment coming to the world as well. In Acts chapter 17, we have seen in verse 30 and 31, the times of this ignorance God winked at. Now he commands all men everywhere to repent. Everyone must repent, change their ways. Because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. Everybody must change their mind and walk in the ways of the Lord. He's going to judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained, who he's given assurance unto all men that he's raised him from the dead. That's Jesus who is going to bring forth the judgment. And we've talked about the fact that the way he judges is according to his word. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. The correction, which is a word only used one time in the Greek, which means a restoration to an upright or right state. That means if we don't receive his correction, we won't be right. We got to receive the correction of the Lord, as well as therefore instruction in righteousness. And we're continuing to talk about the need for correction, and we'll be also talking about the results of the effects if you do not receive the correction, or if you do, the blessings that will come by receiving the correction. We come to Matthew chapter 11, and verse 20. Jesus, of course, went about doing mighty works. And he says, then he began to abrade the cities. Abrade means he began to give them, to reproach them, to revile them, to, to show the fact that they were not doing what was right in his sight, wherein most of his mighty works were done. Why? Because they repented not. They didn't repent. They didn't change their mind. They didn't choose to walk in the way of the Lord, which was a mistake. They needed to be, he did his mighty works. They should have known who he was, but they didn't repent, change their mind, and believe in him. We see in Mark's account, it says something a little bit different. Mark chapter 16, verse 14. Afterward, he appeared in the leaven as they sat at meat, abraded them for their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. Here he came to abrade these ones, this was the eleven, for their unbelief and hardness of heart. We can't have unbelief. We should be believing everything that the Word says. And we cannot have any hardness of heart. God wants us to be totally yielded and walking in the ways of the Lord. Now, we've also talked about scriptures that are important in regards to family and how correction needs to come to children. Here in Ephesians 6.4, it says, You fathers... Provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture. Nurture refers to the training and the discipline, the chastising, means this whole thing, and the admonition or the warning of the Lord. And just as we have to receive it, we also have to bring it to our children. They are to be brought up in the Word of God, and we want to make sure that we are bringing forth the correction, the true doctrine, the true instruction, and also warning them if they do not walk in line with the Word. 
We also saw one scripture that's important to realize, Colossians 1.28. The Word of God is coming to us to do a work in our life. It's going to bring a perfecting work. It says, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. We're to be presented perfect in Christ Jesus. And that is if we do what the Word says. That's why, he's, of course, he's warning them. Of course, he's teaching us because we have to have the Word, the teaching, the correct teaching, so that then as we act upon it, then he'll be able to present every man perfect as we see the work of God be accomplished in our life. We see another thing that works to bring correction to us. Actually, the songs that we sing. Colossians 3, 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing, warning one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Songs are going to be worship unto God, praise and worship to Him, but also they can be teaching and also warning. I think of that song that we have on the tithing song, which is one that is a teaching one and also a warning one that we need to be tithing. Otherwise, uh, the curses that would come upon us if we don't do what He says. We also see in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 14, the correction that comes, God warns us, to take heed to it, see. First Thessalonians 5, 14. We exhort you, brethren, warn them, we've got to warn them, that are unruly. Someone who is unruly is someone who is disorderly. They're out of ranks. They're deviating from the prescribed order or rule. They're not walking in line with the Word. We need to tell them what the Word says, exhort them to do the Word, but we also warn them if they are walking disorderly and if they're deviating from the prescribed order or rule, which would be the Word of God, the commandments of Jesus Christ, the law of Christ that we must walk after. We're also going to comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient towards all men. But we need to warn those ones that they need to come in line with the Word of God and do what is right. Now, how about those ones that aren't, don't want to obey? How do we deal with that? 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 14. If any man obey not our word by this epistle, note, this actually means to mark. You mark that person. If they're not going to take hold of the word and abide it and obey it and do, abide in it and do it, he carries it out, they're not walking right. Note that man or mark that man, and he said, have no company with him. That means you're not going to be in fellowship with that person if they're not going to walk in line with the Word of God. That, in order that, he may be ashamed or he might come to the place of realizing that he's not doing what's right. I mean, he needs to come to the place of repentance and get right with his, in his life. So obedience to the Word will, of course, be shown by fruit and by the works in someone's life. If they won't do that, you mark the person, you have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. And this would be, of course, he'll be ashamed if he doesn't repent. But if he repents, then, of course, he wouldn't be. This is a subjunctive mood, meaning it's a conditional statement. He could repent and get right, which is what God, of course, would want for a person to do. You don't count him as an enemy. You admonish him or warn him as a brother. We're not going to treat someone like an enemy we're going to instead uh, warn them as a brother to get right, get on track. But nonetheless, we're not going to have fellowship with them. We're not going to have, to have company with those people that are not obedient to the Word of God. We come to 2 Timothy chapter 4. We pick up in verse 2. It tells us what you and I are to do. We're to preach the Word to others, proclaim the Word of God, be ready to do it at any time, be instant in season or out of season. And as we do, we also reprove, we rebuke, we also exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. As you're bringing the Word to people and if you are reproving them or rebuking them, make sure that you're doing it with doctrine, with the Word of God. 
You don't give them something without giving them the word that shows what they need to be doing and to bring the correction to them. So everything you're going to bring forth is going to be in line with the word, the doctrine, but also it's going to be in long suffering, you know. You give them opportunity to work and to repent, come to the place of choosing to walk in the way of the Lord. But always bring the word to them, but you need to be ready to reprove, rebuke, and exhort people with the word of God. Of course, if they don't want to listen to it, there are some that won't. Look what it says, the time will come when they'll not endure sound doctrine. People that won't receive the sound doctrine, you're going to be certainly warning them and you're going to be correcting them. Notice it says what they do. After their own lust, they heap themselves to themselves teachers having itching ears. What does that mean? This is a phrase referring to that which people have, are desirous of hearing something pleasant. Tell me something good. I don't want to hear a correction. I don't want to hear anything negative whatsoever. No. These people, they're not wanting to hear the whole word. These are the people that they just want to hear something good. And this is what we see a tremendous error in many churches today that have become what's referred to as seeker-sensitive churches. They only want to bring something forth that somebody would like to hear that would be pleasant to them. Please me. Make me feel good. Feel good type churches. That's a mistake. We've got to bring the whole Word of God to everybody, but we find that people that will not receive the Word or not receive the correction and not endure sound doctrine, these are the type. All they want to do is hear something about good. They'll turn away their ears from the truth and they'll be even turned into fables where they don't even want to hear the Word. They want to hear other things. What a mistake. These people exhort them rebuke them, warn them, so they hopefully will come to the place of repentance. Titus 1, verse 9. It says, Holding fast the faithful word, as he been taught, that's what we are to do, that he may be able by sound doctrine in everything you do in bringing it to people, you're going to bring sound doctrine to them, both to exhort and to convince or refute the gainsayers, this would be the ones who are speaking against what you say. Those that are speaking against, you've got to have the word, so you are ready to give them the answer according to the word of God, not what you think, not your opinion. You need to have, that's why you've got to have the word in you such that you can teach it to others. He goes on and says, for there are many unruly. This is the word referring to those that are not subjected. They're not subjected. They're disobedient. They haven't subjected themselves to the Word of God. Instead, they're just walking in their own ways. Well, these people need to hear the Word of what they're to be doing. And vain talkers and deceivers. And they had the problem, especially the circumcision, at that time. Notice, he says, his mouths must be stopped. They're subverting whole houses, teaching things that they ought not, for filthy lucre's sake. Anybody that's teaching or doing things for money, you know there's something wrong with them. Their mouths need to be stopped. These are the ones that aren't subject to the word, or they wouldn't be doing those things. Vain talkers and deceivers, and those ones that speak against what the word is. We see many people that will speak against the truth, unfortunately. That's why you've got to have sound doctrine to be able to not only exhort, but to refute anything that they might say. We also see another thing that's important. Titus chapter 3, we see people that get into false doctrines that are actually in heresy. It says in Titus 3.10, a man that it's a heretic, this is one who is following a false doctrine. False doctrines that they follow makes them a heretic. It says after the first and second admonition, you warn them, you warn them again. If they continue after two times, you warn them. Reject, it says. You're commanded to reject them. If they aren't going to take heed and won't listen to it, this is an imperative indicating that you're commanded to reject them because you're not going to be around somebody that's going to follow a false doctrine. That's what a heretic is. He goes on and says, knowing that he that is such, a heretic, have following a false doctrine, he's subverted 
He's been twisted. He's been turned away from the truth. And he's sinning continually. This word is showing the fact that anybody's following a false doctrine, they're abiding in sin. You can't be following false doctrine and be right with God. In fact, being condemned of himself, self-condemned. He's condemned of himself because he is following a false doctrine himself. The devil doesn't even have to work against him because he's believed a lie and following after that. These are ones who are heretics. A heretic, again, is one that you must admonish them, tell them, rebuke, be ready to refute the things they say, point out the truth. If they won't listen, then you reject them. That is the right thing to do. In Revelation chapter 3. See, God's going to have his church that's going to be walking in line with the word that's going to be holy and righteous. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 19 also tells us another thing. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Here, we're going to rebuke them. We're going to refute what they say. We're going to bring the, the chastening of the Lord, which is the discipline and the instruction, the teaching. We want to train them and show them what way to walk in. That's what God does. He says, be zealous, therefore, and repent. Be ready to change. Otherwise, we've got to receive his correction. If we don't receive his correction, there's a problem. Now, if we don't receive his correction, there's going to be judgment that is going to come. God expects us to receive his judgment. In Job, chapter 13, in verse 10, he will surely reprove you, judge you, as this means, if you do secretly accept persons. Remember, we're not supposed to be putting one person above another. We're not to have any respect of persons. And if you do it secretly behind the scene, of course, God knows, he's going to surely judge you for it. We must not have respect of persons. We need to treat everybody in line with the Word of God and do what is right and not have certain ones that we're going to show favor to and not to another when there's no reason to not show favor to them. We see over in 2 Samuel, chapter 7, in verse 12. Here he speaks about when the days are fulfilled, sleep with your fathers, I'll set up thy seed after thee, I'll proceed out of thy bowels, I'll establish his kingdom. Here, David, of course, wasn't going to build the house, but Solomon was going to come on the scene. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. That's what was supposed to happen. But notice, I will be his father, he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him. I'm going to judge him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. That's exactly what happened to him, as you will see in a little bit. He did not do what is right. We must understand that God wants to bless us and bring forth thing, good things in our life if we build the spiritual house to him and walk in his ways. But if we commit iniquity, we are going to be judged by him. And also, we see a scripture over in Psalms. See, God is a righteous judge, and he's going to bring correction. He does not want anybody to be having to be judged, but if they don't receive it, then the judgment will come. Psalms 50, verse 16. Unto the wicked God saith, What hast thou to do to declare my statutes? Well, they can't be doing that. Or shouldest thou take my covenant in thy mouth, think they can speak promises into being? No, because they're wicked. Anybody that's walking sin will not be able to put, take hold of the promises and bring forth the, the things that he speaks, uh, his covenant promises to put them in our mouth and speak them into being. Now why? Because they hate instruction, which is the discipline, the chastening, and the correction of the Lord. We have to be receptive to it and castest my words behind thee, meaning they just they ignored them, they cast them aside when someone brings the word to them or God brings it directly to them or someone ministers to them the word of God. That's a mistake. When thou sawest a thief, then you consented with him. It's been partaker with adulterers. He's telling all the different kind of sins. 
Give your mouth to evil. Your tongue frameth deceit. You sit and speak against your brother. You slander thine own mother's son. These things thou hast done, and I kept silence. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such as one as thyself. No, I will reprove thee and set them in order before thine eyes. I'm going to judge you. If we would continue in the sinful ways, judgment is going to come. People will not get away from it. So he says, now consider this, that you forget God, lest I tear you in pieces and there be none to deliver. We can't forget God. We're supposed to draw nigh to God and walk in his ways. When you do that, God will bless you. But if not, you won't be delivered. You'll see a judgment coming upon you. We see another scripture here as we're talking about, at the moment, the negative things that will happen if we don't receive God's correction. Proverbs 5.12 How have I hated instruction and my heart despised reproof? These guys are going to be judged. We can't be hating his discipline, chastening, and correction. We saw the scripture before. Happy is the one who is being corrected, and he's glad to receive the correction of the Lord. And my heart despises the reproof or the rebuke that comes. You get a rebuke or a correction, you should be receiving it, not despising it and resisting it. That is a great mistake. You see in Proverbs chapter 30, Verse 6, add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, judge thee, and thou be found a liar. You can't be adding to his words. Boy, these guys that have added things in the translation that they have no business adding, they're in trouble. Anybody that wants to add to the words as well, then they're going to be judged, and they will found, be found to be a liar. What a mistake. They must come in line and do what is right. Now, if a person's walking in sin, judgment's going to come. Jeremiah 2, verse 19. He says, Thine own wickedness shall correct thee. It shall chasten you and discipline you and uh, instruct you, admonish you. It's going to bring you to the, this place. And thy backsliding shall reprove thee. They're going to judge you. Know therefore and see that it's an evil thing and bitter that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God. That means if you're walking in wickedness, you're backslidden, you're not walking in the way of the Lord, in essence, you've forsaken the Lord. We can't be forsaking Him. And that my fear is not in thee. If the fear of God was before Him, they'd be submitting to Him. This shows you that people that don't walk in line with the Word of God, they are going to be under judgment if they don't come to the place of repentance in their life. In Jeremiah 17, verse 23, They obeyed not, neither inclined their ear, but made their neck stiff. That means they were stubborn. They made it hard, resistant. That they might not hear nor receive the discipline, chasing, and correction. People that won't obey, that are resistant, people that won't listen, people that are going to be stubborn and and so forth, that they might not hear. If they aren't receiving the discipline, the chasing, the correction of the Lord, certainly they're going to be under a judgment. We also see in chapter 30, verse 14, He said, All thy lovers have forgotten thee, they seek thee not. For I have wounded thee with the wound of an enemy, they got judged. With the chastisement of a cruel one, for the multitude of thine iniquity, because thy sins were increased. If you continue to walk in sin, and because of the multitude of that, then there will be absolute judgment. Tremendous judgment will come on a person. In fact, we even see further that this is the type of thing that is going to happen on people that turn their back away from the Lord. Judgment's certainly going to come. Jeremiah 32, Verse 33, they've turned unto me the back and not the face, though I taught them. These are people that were taught the word, rising up early and teaching them, yet they've not hearkened to receive the discipline, chasing, and correction. We must receive the discipline, chasing, and correction, or else you're in trouble. You turn your back, 
You're not going to, you're going to see judgment. You're not going to see God's blessings. This is why always receive his discipline, correction, and instruction. No one's going to get away with ignoring it, that's for sure. Zephaniah, chapter 3. Here we pick up in Zephaniah chapter 3 quite a statement. This is relating to end times. Woe to her that's filthy and polluted in the, to the oppressing city. How did she get filthy and polluted? Because of these things. She obeyed not the voice. They didn't obey what God said. She received not correction. She wouldn't be, they wouldn't be corrected. Trusted not in the Lord. You can't trust in the Lord and not listen to his, his voice and obey it and receive his correction. You can't be ignoring it. She drew not near to her God. She basically was living her own life. Her princes within are roaring lions and her judges are evening wolves. They gnaw not, not the bones till the morrow. Her prophets were light and treacherous persons. And they only wanted to tell them what they wanted to hear. Her priests have polluted the sanctuary because they haven't made things right and they've allowed evil to come in. They've done violence to the law. What would that be? Because they're not doing what the Word says. They've left things out or changed it or, or didn't preach the whole thing. You can't be doing that. The just lords in the midst thereof, he will not do iniquity. Every morning does he bring his judgment to light. He fails not, but the unjust knoweth no shame. That's the ones who are walking in unrighteousness. See, the more you do so, the more you get deceived. And the more you, deception, the deception hardens your heart and they continue to walk in these evil ways. Notice what he says. I've cut off the nations. Their towers are desolate. I made their streets waste. This is what's going to happen to the nations that forget God. Their, city, their cities are destroyed so that there's no man, that there is none inhabitant. Well, that means tremendous judgment. This is speaking about the judgment that's going to come on the nations that won't obey him. I said, surely thou wilt fear me. Thou wilt receive the discipline, chastening, and correction, so their dwelling should not be cut off. Howsoever I punished them, they rose early and corrupted all their doings. God's a merciful God. He's ready to forgive. And he will not bring judgment if we come in line with what he says. Therefore wait upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey. For my determination is to gather the nations. And he's going to do that in the end. That I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger. This is a righteous judgment. For all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. These are all the ones that have done evil. There is going to be a judgment that is going to come upon them. Well, if we don't listen to his word and obey and receive his correction, walk in all his ways, there's going to be a lot of judgment coming. Leviticus 26 makes it very clear that he expects us to obey what he says. Verse 14, If you will not hearken unto me, and will not do all these commandments, if we won't obey the commands, if you should despise my statutes, if your soul abhor my judgments, so that you will not do all my commandments, but you break my covenant. Notice, you can break covenant. How do you break covenant? By not doing what his commandments are. By not doing his word. In reality, you're breaking covenant with him. That's why he's not going to perform covenant promises if you are walking contrary to his ways. I will also do this unto you. Now he talks about the judgments. I will even appoint over you terror, consumption, burning agu. You'll consume the eyes, sorrow of heart. You'll sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. Otherwise, it's not going to produce a harvest. It's not going to get, get blessed whatsoever, because they're not walking in the ways of the Lord. Then he says, I'll set my face against you, and you'll be slain before your enemies. This will happen as well. They that hate you shall reign over you, and you shall flee when none pursueth you. And if you will not yet for all this hearken unto me, then I'll punish you seven times more for your sins. You know, this has already happened. Who did it happen for? Israel. The first punishment was the 70 years in Babylon. 
But after that, then the punishment was that they could not become a nation. And remember, we've already given you the information in the past how they couldn't become a nation until 1948, or as May 14th, I think it was 1948, when they became a nation. That was the end of the punishment. Many people have thought, oh, God finally brought them back into being a nation. No, that was the end of the punishment. They were under a curse all along. They couldn't become one until the end of the punishment period. God's a righteous God, and He doesn't want to do that. He wants to bless us if we will obey and do the things that He says. They just, they wouldn't listen to Him. We come down to verse 28, and He says, I'll walk contrary to you also in fury, and I even I will chasten, discipline, instruct, admonish you seven times for your sins. You know, this is in line with the scriptures as well. Think about it. If you cast a demon out and you go back into sin, what happens? Not only does it come back in, but it also comes back with seven more wicked. Now you're in worse shape. We cannot allow ourselves to continue to walk in sin and think that we will be right with God and not escape, escape any kind of judgment. Judgment will come. Deuteronomy 21. Verse 18 says, If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, this is what happened in the Old Testament, which will not obey the voice of his father and the voice of his mother, that when they've chastened him, they chastened him, they disciplined him, they instructed him, they admonished him, will not hearken unto them. Would there be a judgment that comes? There was then, and there'll be one down the road as well. Look what happened. Father and mother laid hold on him, brought him to the elders of the city, and what'd they do? The elders of the city said, this is our son. He's re stubborn, rebellious. He'll not obey our voice. He's a glutton and a drunkard. And all the men of the city shall stone him with stones that he die. So they put away evil away from among you. All Israel shall hear and fear. Now God's a merciful God and he's a forgiving God in the New Testament era. Of course, he was also would cover over their sins in the Old Testament. But at the same time, if we do not come to repentance and turn away, Judgment will come. People have this mentality a lot of times. Well, God's merciful. He's not going to judge me. You're not thinking right. He is a righteous God. He's going to judge according to righteousness. Every person must come in line with the Word of God so they don't see judgment come. Instead, we want to see the opposite. The blessings will come. God wants to bring blessings upon us, and He will. Proverbs 5 Verse 22, look what it says. His own iniquities shall take the wicked himself. We're, we're controlled and trapped by our iniquities until we repent and confess them. He shall be holden with the cords of his sins. It's like there's spiritual cords of your sins that are holding you captive until you confess the sin, repent, have a godly sorrow, and turn away from it. What's going to happen? He's going to die without Discipline, chasing, and correction come into repentance. In the greatness of his folly, he shall go astray. This is why being correctable, being receiving the correction of the Lord, the discipline of the Lord is so important. You can't ignore it and think that you're going to get away with it. It's not going to happen. The correction will come or the judgment will come, one or the other. Proverbs 15, verse 10. Correction is grievous unto him that forsakes the way. He wants to walk in his own way. He didn't want to be corrected. But if you are walking in the way of the Lord, you want to be corrected. So you get on the right path. He that hates reproof, any kind of that rebuke or correction, he's going to die. We've got to receive the correction of the Lord. You cannot ignore it. Proverbs chapter 19 Verse 27, cease, my son, to hear the discipline, chastening, correction that causes to err from the words of knowledge. Are you not hearing this? Are you not receiving this? This is what's causing you to err from the words of knowledge? Boy, you've got to stop this. So you don't. You need to hear these things, to hear the, the truth and come to the place of repentance so you walk in the ways of the Word of God from now on. That is mandatory. And look at this scripture. In Proverbs 29, 
This is for the one who thinks that he's getting away with it even though he hasn't responded to it at all. No. Look what it says, Proverbs 29, 1. He that being often reproved, time after time after time after time, he's hardening his neck, he's getting stubborn and stubborn and more stubborn, what's going to happen? Well, it looks like nothing's going to happen. No. Shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. Sudden destruction comes on people that continue to not hearken to God's correction, and they're stubborn and resistant and rebellious and won't do what he tells them to do. We see the same thing brought forth in Isaiah chapter 13, verse 30, verse 13. Isaiah 30, verse 13. It's talking about the iniquity that builds up. You know, when the iniquity come, cup comes full, then, then the judgment comes. This iniquity shall be to you as a breach, a break, ready to fall, swelling out in a high wall, whose breaking cometh suddenly at an instant. People wonder why sudden things happen, calamities, after they've been walking in sin and resisting the correction. They won't get right with God. People have been trying to get them on the right path. They've been telling them that they're, maybe they're doing wrong, walking the wrong way, sinning, teaching the wrong thing. That's the same kind of thing. You can't be doing that. There's going to be a judgment. People will not get away with what they're continuing to do. They may think they are, but no. God sees everything. He's long-suffering. He wants everybody to come to repentance, of course. But they're not going to get away with it. Jeremiah 5, verse 3. O Lord, are not thine eyes upon the truth? That's right. That's what he gauges everything after the truth. Thou hast stricken them but they've not grieved. This is where he brought judgment upon them, and they should have come to repentance because judgment, and minor judgments are meant to bring you to repentance. But they didn't grieve. You've consumed them, but they refuse to receive correction. They've made their faces harder than a rock. They've refused to return. Why are these people in trouble? God, of course, he is merciful. He's long-suffering. He wants everybody to come to repentance. And here, look what it says regarding the nation. This is why we continually are praying for this nation, as well as all the nations of the world, to get right with God and to turn to Him. Remember, nations that forget Him will be turned into hell. Jeremiah 7, 28. Thou shalt say unto them, This is a nation that obeys not the voice of the Lord their God, nor receives correction. Truth is perished and is cut off from their mouth. This is why we want righteous leaders, people that have the fear of God and will listen and do what's right in the sight of the Lord and walk in the ways of the Word of God. And that's why we continue to pray and remitting the sins of this nation that they will come to the place of obeying and receiving the correction. Of course, the devil works to try to get the truth to be perished and cut off from their mouth. We see another place in 1 Timothy chapter 1. Verse 18, he's talking here to Timothy and he says, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies that went before on thee, that you by them you might war a good warfare. Holding faith, that's how you're going to be able to do it, and a good conscience, because you're walking right and you've dealt with everything in your life, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. Eh, they're not walking by faith anymore. Their, their faith has gone shipwreck and not operating. And he says, these are, here's the two of these guys, Humanius uh, and Alexander. And because of that, they continued to reject the word. As Alexander, remember, did him much evil because he continually was resistant to the word of God. Whom I've delivered unto Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. These people were speaking a lot of reproach, reviling, speaking evil speaking things that were considered as blasphemous, speaking evil. They get delivered over to Satan for the destruction. That's why we got to make sure that we are receptive to the Word and doing the Word. These people just turn totally away from it. There will be judgment. They won't get away with it. One thing you have to realize, nobody's getting away with anything. You might think they are. They're not. Nobody gets away. Everybody 
is going to be standing judgment. Everybody is going to have an effect from their sins if they do not confess their sins and repent. This is the case where the man was involved in incest. And Paul came, because they wouldn't deal with it, at Corinth. In verse 5, to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. What was the problem? He was committing incest, having his father's wife. How terrible. And he wouldn't repent. And the church was letting it go on, which is wrong. Notice, the destruction will occur. That the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Remember, what does God want? He wants us to come to repentance. And in turning him over to Satan, that was the judgment. To what? To hopefully bring him to repentance. If he would come to repentance, he could be saved. Now, it wasn't that he's automatically going to be saved. You say, well, I thought he was born again. Isn't that the old once saved, always saved? He's going to be, you know, even though if he does some wrong things, he's still going to be saved like some people teach out there. You commit fornication or whatever, you're still going to be saved. No. The reason is because this doesn't mean it's going to happen automatically. This is a subjunctive mood verb. The subjunctive mood is a conditional statement. What it means is that he may be saved if he meets the conditions, which would be what? Confess that sin, repent, stop it, turn away from it, and start walking right, holy before the Lord. Otherwise, he would not be saved. Judgments will happen. And, and he's also saying, this is affecting the whole church there. He said, your glory is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. It was contaminating the church. That's why we got to have people. We can't have those kind of things going on in a church. That is going to bring a judgment. We also see involving Saul. Remember Saul? He was the king, but he was disobeying and not doing the things that God told him to do. 1 Samuel chapter 15. Here is where they come, and he's speaking to Saul here, Samuel is. And he says, The Lord sent you on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them till they be consumed. Whatever God tells us to do in his word or whatever, we should do it and carry it out. Well, he didn't. He said, Wherefore, you didn't obey the voice of the Lord. You fly upon the spoil and did evil in the sight of the Lord. It was wrong. Saul speaks back to him and says, well, uh, Yeah, I've obeyed the voice of the Lord. I've gone the way which the Lord sent me. And I brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and I've utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took the spoil. He's responsible for what happens, but he wants to blame it on the people. He's a blame shifter. Don't be a blame shifter. Well, this happened, or so-and-so did this, or this is why it happened. No. What you're told to do, there is no excuse. They took the spoil, sheep and oxen, sheep of the things they should have been other destroyed to sacrifice unto the Lord. Does God want sacrifice? No, He wanted them destroyed. That's why He says, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices? Is it obeying the voice of the Lord? No. To obey is better than sacrifice and hearken than the fat of rams. He's not interested in that. He wanted them to obey. And now He's telling them their rebellion is the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, what happened to him? He's been rejected from being king. He lost his kingship because of the fact that he rebelled against God. He says, I've sinned, I've transgressed. But now he comes along and he says, it's because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. You cannot be having the fear of the people, that'll make you a people pleaser instead of a God pleaser. You can't be a man pleaser, you gotta be a God pleaser. You gotta do what God says. You can't be obeying someone else's voice and putting that before God. Of course, he's asking, he's wanting him to pardon his sin. Samuel says, no, you rejected the word of the Lord, the Lord has rejected you from being king. He lost his kingship because of the fact that he did not obey, do what God told him to do. What a mistake. 
And he, of course, he wanted to stop that, and so he laid hold on the skirt of the mantle of, of Samuel and, and rent it, tore it. And so Samuel, of course, says, the Lord has rent the kingdom of Israel from you this day. Just as you tore his mantle, he says, he's torn, taken it away from you. He's given it to a neighbor of thine that's better than thou. He lost it because he didn't carry out what was right in the sight of the Lord. We see another case over here. This is involving David. David, he was making a mistake. This is a time, it says, in 2 Samuel 11, 1, it came to pass after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle. Was David the king? Yeah. Was he supposed to go forth to battle? Yeah. Was he, did he do that? No. He sent Joab and his servants with him. He didn't, he didn't want to go to the battle. He wanted somebody else to go do it. That's a mistake. You got to be involved in the warfare. Someone's not going to fight for you. You got to get involved in warring the warfare and fighting the fight. So he stayed at Jerusalem. Well, if you're in sin and you're not doing what God says, you're now set up for a fall. And that's exactly what happened. What's he do? He gets off his bed. He comes out on his roof, sees this woman washing herself. She's very beautiful to look upon and inquired about the woman. You shouldn't be doing that. And the one said, hey, this is Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah. He's another man's wife. Did that matter to him? No, he took, them, took her and came into her, lay with her, and committed adultery with her. What a wrong thing. Of course, was he going to get away with it? No. And then he, to cover it up, if we go through the whole story, Uriah, which is the husband, he came and he said, well, you go down to his house, go down to your house, figuring he'd go and he'd be with his wife. Well, he didn't. <laughs> he, sat, uh, he sat on the outside and he didn't go in to be with his wife whatsoever. And after he found that out, well, that didn't work to kind of cover over his adultery because it turned out she was with child, see. She sent, sent, conceived and said, I'm with child. So now he's got a real problem. Well, so what's he do? I got to get rid of this guy. So he sends him to the hottest part of the battle to kill him so he would die. So not only has he committed adultery, but now he's committed murder. What a terrible thing. Is he going to get away with this? No. We come down to chapter 12. Nathan comes, he's a prophet, comes to David, and he speaks to him here, talking about here are two men in a city, one rich, the other poor. Rich man had many flocks and herds. Poor man had one little ewe lamb. And he goes on in this little statement and says, the traveler, this rich man, comes and takes of his own flock and his own herd and dresses for the wayfaring man that was come to him and took the poor man's lamb. He took what was belonging to this guy that was a poor one for himself. Well, David, of course, hearing this was anger and said, ah, this guy's got to die. He's going to surely die. And of course, he said he was supposed to restore to him because he did this. And Nathan now, of course, calls him on the carpet and says, you're the guy. <laughs> this is what you did. You are the man. And so he's now called on the carpet for what he did. And so, of course, he is now in trouble. He says, you despise the commandment of the Lord. You've killed Uriah the Hittite with a sword. You've taken his wife to be, uh, his wife to be your wife, and you've slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Is, there gonna, is he going to get away with this just because he's the king? No. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from thine house. He had nothing but problems since after that. Because thou hast despised me, hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. And he also pronounced the fact that the child was going to die. That he wasn't going to, wasn't going to live at all. This child that he had. He talked about how he sinned, and he said, "Because you've done this deed, the child that's born unto thee shall surely die." And it did. Judgment came. We don't get away with sin. We must make sure that we are not walking in any kind of ways of sin. We also see. We talk, go over to 1 Kings chapter 11, talking about Solomon. Solomon's the one who had this tremendous wisdom, 
tremendous things that accomplished, wrote all these Proverbs and Song of Solomon, all these different things. King Solomon loved many strange women. All these ones, the ites. Was he supposed to be involved with the ites? No way. Of the nation concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, you don't go into them, neither they'll come into you, for surely they'll turn away your heart after other gods. This is a guy who should never have even considered such a thing. What happened? He had all these wives and they turned his heart away. And so what happened? As when he got old, his wives turned him away in his heart after other gods. He even went after other gods now. His heart was not perfect with the Lord, his God, as it says. And he went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. Now he's involved in idolatry. It shows you, sin will take you down a destructive path. He just didn't get to some ites and have those kind of, next thing you know, his heart's getting turned away. And now he's in idolatry. And he's doing all these evil things. He did not follow after the Lord. He even built a high place for Chemosh here and Molech. These were idols. How evil can you get? He did for all strange wives, sacrificing unto their gods. Could this guy be escape judgment? No way. <laughs> the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord thy God, who had appeared to him twice. God appeared to him twice, and yet he turns away from him. How amazing that he did such an evil thing. He didn't, he told him, you know, you're not going to go after other gods. And remember, he said, if he does iniquity, he's going to be judged. And that's exactly what happened. So he says, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee and give it to thy servant. He lost the kingdom because he did evil. You and I will not get away from any areas of sin. We must come in line, and if you continue in sin, you'll, things will get worse and worse. It'll progress. The more you give place to it, the, the more thing, evil spirits will come into you, and the more they'll drive you into more evil in your life. Matthew 21, verse 43. Look what it says. Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof, the one who's walking in the way of the Lord. Otherwise, if you're not walking in the way of the Lord, you're not going to be ruling and reigning either. But if you are, you're going to have the fruits. And then you're going to be in the rule and the reign with Jesus Christ in the millennial reign. Most all these Christians think they're automatically going to be in the reign with God. Not so if you're not walking right and you don't have the fruits of righteousness which brings forth holiness. It will not happen in a person's life. Now what about the blessings that will come? We've seen these tremendous destructive things that will happen. There are blessings that come, because remember, everybody needs to be corrected and come in line. Job 5, 17. Happy, blessed, is the man whom God correcteth. Therefore, despise not the chastening of the Almighty. You'll be happy and you'll be blessed because you come in line with the Word and you're doing what is right in His sight. We also see in Job 36, verse 10, He opens their ear to discipline, His chasing and correction. God will bring it to you. Commands that they return from iniquity. Of course, He expects you to act on the discipline and stop the sinning and walk right from now on. If they obey and serve Him, well, that means they've, they got on the right pa path now. They'll spend their days in prosperity and years in pleasures. That means God, He'll forgive you and His blessings will come and you'll be prospered and you'll be seeing His pleasures, His blessings coming upon you. But of course, if you obey not, what's going to happen? They perish by the sword and die without knowledge. You and I must receive the correction of the Lord so we can be blessed. And we will be. He'll prosper us. He'll bless us in our life. Psalms 118, verse 18. The Lord hath chastened me sore. He had a lot of things that needed to get straightened out, and God came and <laughs> dealt with him and chastened him sore. But he hath not given me over unto death. 
He didn't kill them, but he did chase them a lot of ways. Of course, what's the purpose? To bring them to repentance, to get right. Open to me the gates of righteousness. Well, isn't that what we're supposed to have? The fruits of righteousness? Shall we walk in the right path? Yeah. I will go into them and I will praise the Lord. Otherwise, he's saying, he corrected me. And now, op open the gates of righteousness. I'm going to go this righteous way. I am going to walk in the way of righteousness now. This gate of the Lord into which the righteous shall enter. And you have to be righteous to enter in, remember. That's the way to go. I'll praise thee, for thou hast heard me and have become my salvation. Well, that tells you who gets saved. The ones who go through the righteous gate. If you're not righteous, are you going to be saved? No. That destroys that old once saved, always saved lie, doesn't it? You've got to be righteous, and you've got to go through the gates of righteousness to enter in, doing what he says. He says, I'll go into them, and I will praise the Lord. And that's when, of course, he'll become his salvation. We also see the blessings. If, if you've been off track and God comes along and brings you reproof, correction, look what he says he'll do for you. Proverbs 1, 23, Turn you at my reproof, my rebuke, my correction, my reproof, chastisement, even if it's punishment, whatever it might be, I will pour out my spirit upon you, and I will make known my words unto you. Well, that's God's blessing coming to you. He's going to give you revelation. He'll show you what to do. And he'll lead you now in the paths that's going to bring victory forth in your life. Proverbs 4, verse 13. Take fast hold of discipline, chastening, and correction, this means. Let her not go. Keep her. Watch over her. For she is thy life. Well, that means if you don't, you're going to die, remember. But if you take heed to it and hold on to it, meaning you incorporate that into your lifestyle and walk in the way of the Lord, you're going to have life. You're going to be blessed from the Lord. In fact, it even calls this the way of life, the correction, in Proverbs 10, 17. He is in the way of life that is keep, keeping, guarding the discipline, chasing, and correction. Because you're going to be on the right path, and that's the way that leads to eternal life. But he that refuses reproof, he won't receive it. He's erring, and he is going down a path of destruction. Proverbs 13 tells us what happens in either case. Poverty and shame shall be to him that refuses the discipline, chasing, and correction. People aren't going to get away with it. It's going to come on them. But he that regards the reproof, he takes it, observes it, gives heed to it. The reproof, the rebuke, correction, reproof, he's going to be honored. He's going to be blessed by God. When God honors you. You're going to see his blessings coming upon you in your life. Proverbs 15 tells us more. Verse 5. A fool despises his father's Discipline, chasing, and correction. But he that regards the reproof, he's prudent. He's one that's going to become wise. He's going to be prudent. He's going to have understanding. He's going to see God's blessing come in his life. This is in a positive sense. These other ones mean if it's in a negative sense. So he's going to be blessed of God, prudent, if he's doing the right, if he receives that correction. Verse 31. The ear that hears the reproof of life abides among the wise, because you'll be wise. Wise people will receive the correction. He that refuses the discipline, chasing, and correction, notice it says he even despises his own soul, because if he continues to sin, his soul is going to be, and he's going to have a hardened heart, he's going to have all kinds of deception coming, he's going to have all kinds of destruction, calamities will be coming. But he that hears the reproof, what's going to happen for him? He's going to get understanding. God will not only open your eyes and make known his words, he'll give you the understanding of the things that you have need of to walk in the ways of the Lord. And here's one that even talks about in your latter days how important it is to have received his correction. Proverbs 19, verse 20. 
Hear counsel, receive discipline, chastening, correction, that you may be wise in thy latter end. It'll produce wisdom. You aren't going to get wisdom unless you're in line with the Word. And you aren't going to get wisdom unless you hear His counsel and receive His discipline correction. It's not going to come to you. And you need wisdom to walk in the ways of the Lord. The Bible says get wisdom. It's the principal thing. You must get it, and it will come from the Lord as you hearken to Him. We also see something over in 2 Timothy. It tells us how we deal with people. 2 Timothy 2, verse 24. The servant of the Lord must not strive. He doesn't get into a fight. He doesn't get into arguments and so forth. But he's to be gentle unto all men, to teach, apt to teach, patient or forbearing towards them. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God, peradventure, will give them repentance, a change of mind, not to the acknowledging, but to the, it's a noun, the precise, correct knowledge of the truth. The reason we say that is because if it's acknowledging, it would be like a participle with the ing on the end of it. But it's not. This is the word. It is a noun. That's why it should be translated knowledge, or in reality, this word epigenosis means precise, correct knowledge. So, because what happens? When you come to repentance, you're going to come to what? Get precise, correct knowledge of the truth and start walking in that. That's what has to happen for people that are opposing themselves. That they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. That means people that are walking in sin that are opposing themselves. The devil, remember, he's accuser of the brethren, accuses us night and day of our sins. He can come in and he can take dominion over you and and bring you into captivity. Notice, he was taken captive by him at his will. That's the will of the enemy. The person has to recover themselves out of it. How are they going to recover themselves out of it? Well, they're going to have to come to the place of repentance, changing their mind, stopping walking in that way. They've got to come to the precise, correct knowledge of the truth. And then they're also going to have to recover themselves, as it says, out of the snare of the devil. They're going to have to cast out the demons. They're going to have to resist the enemy. They're going to have to take all the promises. They're going to have to conquer the enemy's attacks, any temptations. So they come out of the snare of the devil because the enemy has been able to take them captive. We see another place here over in Titus. Titus 1.9, hold fast the faithful word as you've been taught, that you may be able to, by sound doctrine, to exhort and convince those ones that are speaking against. We saw that. And then we come down to, we saw the unruly ones. We saw the ones whose mouth must be stopped. We come down to verse 13. Is this witness is true, wherefore rebuke them sharply. There's many times to rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, yeah, so that they can come in line. They need to be dealt with, to come in line with the Word of God. Titus 2, verse 15. These things speak and exhort and rebuke, so refute with all authority. Let no man despise you. Don't back off of speaking, exhorting, rebuking with all authority. You have to do it. You have to step up and do things. You can't let things slide whatsoever. These things must be done. And then we're going to look here again at Hebrews before we conclude on this. Hebrews tells us how important it is to receive the correction of the Lord. Hebrews 12, verse 5. He said, You've forgotten the exhortation which speak to you as unto children. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when you're rebuked of him. We must receive the correction of the chastening of the Lord. The whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. This is God's love being shown towards you. He scourges every son whom he receiveth. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. For what son is he whom the father chastens not? Of course, he's going to correct him. If you be without chastisement, notice, 
where of all are partakers, then you are, this would be the word meaning illegitimate. Well, that means you're not sons. Well, are you going to be right with God? No. It is mandatory to receive the correction because why would you be illegitimate? Because you're abiding in sin and you're not walking right. You haven't dealt with the correction. Furthermore, we've had fathers of our flesh which corrected us. We gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection to the Father of spirits? The Father, Heavenly Father, the Father of us, our spirits. We got born from above, remember, and live. We got to be in subjection to Him. Submission unto His Word, because His Word is, the, is right. It's the correct way. It's the truth. It's what you're going to be judged by. For verily, they verily for a few days chasten us after their own pleasure, talking about earthly fathers, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. This is important. Correction will come in order that you might be a partaker of his holiness, to be a partaker, actually, of his holiness uh, unto him. Separation becoming sanctified. So without correction, can we ever partake of holiness? No. You've got to receive the correction of the Lord. And then he says, the chastening for the presence doesn't seem to be joyous. Of course it doesn't. But it's grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness if what? If you receive it and do it unto them that are exercised thereby. Otherwise, you've got to receive the correction, change your ways, and walk in line with the Word of God and bring forth the fruit of righteousness by doing what's right from that point on. Mandatory. We come down to verse 14. Follow peace with all men in holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Meaning, if you're not holy, you are not going to see the Lord. Because righteousness produces holiness that produces everlasting life. Now, before we conclude, remember, we saw in the beginning, when the first time, that in Revelation 2 and 3, that there were judgments that came, because that's the judgment on the church, remember. God brought forth what needed to correct, be corrected, told them that if they didn't get corrected, the judgments that would come. But he also told them if they did, and they overcame and conquered and carried off the victory, the blessings that would come. We see this here, and we'll look at these few scriptures before we conclude. Because this is the judgment coming on the church, the results. If they wouldn't repent, Revelation 2, 5, he said, I will come quickly and remove thy candlestick out of its place. That would be the presence of God would leave. That's what will happen. God will leave those and this judgment that's going to come upon the church. For those that continue in the false doctrine, remember, of the Nicolaitans, which is really essentially the once saved, always saved belief, but the lie, repent or else I'll come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Now, they're going to be in trouble, for sure. Remember that we talked about that, but we'll just reiterate this for you. The Nicolaitan belief was, the doctrine was, they believed that grace and mercy was the basis of salvation, which is true. But they believed that man could partake of sin because the law was not binding, because they thought they were only under grace, automatic, and not under any law, which is wrong. We're under the law of Christ in the New Testament. And they considered that grace reckoned righteousness automatically, regardless of their works. No, there's conditions for grace to reign. It's through righteousness. We saw that scripture in Romans. They taught the flesh and sin had no effect on the soul. That's a lie. You walk in the ways of the flesh or the sin, it does have an effect. They were claiming that the spirit of a person was saved, and, but sin dwells in the flesh, and you can remain, you're remaining a sinner and always are going to sin. That's false. We're not a sinner any longer. We have a brand new spirit, remember. See, that's their justification. Because we're always going to sin, so since our spirit's saved, everything should be fine. What deception. We're not a sinner. 
We have a righteous spirit. And we are to conquer all sin, all the commands to put sin away and stop sinning, have no dominion over you, not yield to it any longer. So they got deceived. So they thought they were still saved because of the fact that their spirit was changed and they have a new spirit. But that's a lie. It's the whole package, as we've seen, because only those who are doing righteousness continually are righteous. And those who are not doing righteous are not of God. We've seen those scriptures out of 1 John 3, verse 7 and verse 10. So he's going to fight against them with the sword of his mouth. These guys are going to be in trouble. They don't repent from those false ones. And then we have the compromise judgment. This is the one where Jezebel was teaching the people at Thyatira that they could commit fornication and eat things sacrificed to idols, and it was okay. The reason they were saying that was because at Thyatira, trade unions were how the people had jobs. In order to get a job, you had to belong to a trade union. Well, the trade unions were run by the fornicators and the idolaters. And if you became part of the trade union, you had to participate in all these things. So, well, you need a job, so it's okay to commit fornication and be involved in this idolatry. No, it's not. It was a compromise, and it was a lie. It's like someone says, well, God told me it's okay. No, it's not okay. It's not in line with the word whatsoever. Gave her space to repent, didn't repent. What's going to happen? Cast her into a bed that committed adultery with her into great tribulation. Are these going to pass the test? No, they're going to be cast into great tribulation, and they are going to be destroyed in the judgment that's going to be poured out. And what's going to happen to the followers? I'll kill her children. That would be if the followers with death. And all the churches shall know these are the holy ones that come through successfully through the judgment. They're going to know I'm the one who searches, examines. This is the soul it talks about. The inmost thoughts, feelings, purposes of the soul and the heart. He's looking on our soul. He's looking on our heart. And I'll give unto every one of you according to your works. So if your works are wrong, then the judgment was going to come. So they're going to be cast into the tribulation, great tribulation. They're going to get destroyed. And as we follow them, are all going to get destroyed as well. Then we saw another judgment that will come. This is if people don't repent. This is the one who wouldn't repent. He said, I will come on thee as a thief. You won't know what hour I'm going to come upon you. That means suddenly. And a judgment was going to come on them. Their name was going to be blotted out of the book of life because of what they have done. We'd see in verse 16, you're lukewarm. What's he say for the lukewarm one? I'm going to vomit you. This means to vomit out of my mouth. Well, these are all the judgments that come. Otherwise, these people don't pass the test. The presence of God leaves. They're going to be fought against. They're going to be cast into great tribulation. They're going to get killed. They're going to come. He's going to come as a thief. And they're going to see judgment come suddenly. They're going to be blotted out of the book of life. And they're going to be spewed out. That's for the people that don't pass the test. But how about the people that do pass the test? Aha. Every one of us and every one of these ones are expected to conquer and overcome. You and I are able to overcome and be completely victorious in everything. To him that overcometh, conquer and carry off the victory. He's going to eat of the tree of life in the midst of the paradise of the garden, of God. Up in there, it's going to, you're going to be able to partake of that. Oh, that means you're going to make it to heaven. Verse 10, those ones that are going to be faithful, they're going to get a crown of life, even if they're faithful unto death. They're going to get blessed. Further, if you overcome, you shall not be hurt of the second death. Now, people have taught, well, I'm born again. Uh, the, her second death won't hurt me automatically. Not so. And one of the ways you can even prove that is because, not only what we know from other scriptures, but this is when it says, you shall not be hurt, that's not a good translation. He that overcometh might not, because you and I are the ones to overcome, might not, because of subjunctive mood, be hurt of the second death. How could we be hurt? if we turn away from walking in the way of the Lord and don't meet the conditions. In other words, the point being, 
Some people can be heard of the second death and some people won't. The ones who conquer and overcome will not. And what's the second death? Separation from God forever and you'll be in the lake of fire and you will be tormented forever. Verse 17. The one who conquers and overcomes, he's going to eat the hidden manna. He'll give him the white stone. He's going to get a new name. What does that mean? When do you get a new name? When you get married, right? Are we going to get married? Oh, yeah. The bridegroom is going to take the bride, all the holy ones, and we're going to get a new name. This speaks of the marriage that's going to happen. What else? He that overcomes and keeps my works unto the end, which is also implying what shows you're really walking and overcoming and conquering. You're keeping his works to the end. You just don't, you don't give up on it or turn away from it. To him will I give authority over the nations. And you'll be put in some position of authority. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. the vessels of a potter. They'll be broken to shivers, even as I received in my father. Jesus is going to rule with a rod of iron, and you and I will have our place involved in, in that rule in the millennial kingdom, and it'll be with the rod of iron according to the word of God. And you'll be given the morning star, which is Jesus. Chapter 3, verse 5. The one that overcomes, what's going to happen? He's going to be clothed with white raiment. He's going to have his name confessed before the Father. And he's not going to get his name blotted out. His name will be written in the book of life. How about in verse 12? The one who overcomes, he's going to be made a pillar in the temple of my God. We're going to have the name of God, the name of the city of my God, the New Jerusalem. Well, that means you're going to get into the New Jerusalem. Aha, that means you're going to be here in the, in the new heavens and the new earth, and you're going to be in that new Jerusalem. Praise God. In verse 21. The one that conquers and overcomes, I'll grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I overcame and sat down with my Father in his throne, to rule and to reign together with Jesus. Tremendous things are going to happen. And the only ones that get into, remember, into heaven into the New Jerusalem. Revelation 22, 14. Blessed are they who are doing ongoingly, present tense, His commandments. Well, that means they're obeying the Word. That they may have, or that theirs, more literally, that the authority shall be theirs. This is the word here. Right means authority, exousia. In the word order, Young's has it right. The authority shall be theirs unto the tree of life. Meaning you don't have the right to the tree of life unless you meet the conditions. And by the gates that they may enter in and again, this is a conditional statement because it's a subjunctive mood, meaning only ones that enter in through the gates of the city are the ones who've met the conditions who are what? Doing his commandments and walking in the ways of the Lord. Therefore, as we've looked at these three, last three messages, you've seen all the things that have come forth about the judgments and the correction. The correction, discipline, must be received, taken heed to, walk in line with the Word, do what the Word says, get right, make sure that you have had a true confession of sin, godly sorrow, and you can't sweep it under the rug and ignore it. It won't go away. You may think it's gone away. Nothing's gone away with the Lord. Everything has to be dealt with. And when you do, then, of course, then you're not going to see these judgments and the punishments that came upon them as we see clearly what happened in the Word. Instead, we can see the tremendous blessings that God will bring forth. Everybody has to have correction, come in line with the Word. So we receive the correction. We take hold of it. We exercise ourselves in it. We have the fruits of righteousness. We become a partaker of His holiness, which produces everlasting life. And we're going to be one of the ones who conquer and see all these tremendous blessings come upon us because we have done what He said and received His correction. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank You and praise You for the correction of the Lord that comes unto me. I welcome it. I receive it. I'm happy about it. I want it. So I get everything right in my life. 
It restores me to an upright state. Walking in the way of the Lord. Please correct me in every area that needs correction. I will receive it. I will be a doer of the word. I will confess any sins. I will have a godly sorrow. Working in repentance. I will change my mind. Get the word in me. Walk in the way of the word. Bring forth fruits of righteousness. I be a partaker of your holiness. So I will have everlasting life. And I will see all these tremendous blessings coming to pass in my life. And I will rule and reign with Jesus in the millennial reign. And I'll be with the Father in Jesus in the new heavens and the new earth. And I'll be in the new Jerusalem. I thank you. I will always receive correction. And I will get in line with the word of God. So I see the results. Roots of righteousness unto holiness producing everlasting life. Thank you for correcting me. In Jesus' name, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Three messages that are also very important for us for the end times, because we must be correctable. We must come to the place of righteousness and holiness and walking in your ways. Thank you for correcting every one of us, and thank you that we have received correction, and we will come in line with your word and meet the conditions to be righteous, holy, and have everlasting life and be with you in the millennial reign and with the Father and you in the, we know, in the new heavens and the new earth and the new Jerusalem. Father, we thank you and praise you for this great mighty work that you're doing in our life. Thank you for correcting every one of us. We will receive it and see the fruit of it in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God.